Peruk Mar is an assistant professor. <laughs> is an assistant professor in the School of Computing at the University of Utah. He obtained his PhD from the University of Illinois at Ur 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 uh, Urbana-Champaign in 2013 and was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. His research lies in the area of natural language processing and machine learning and has primarily been driven by questions arising from the need to learn structured representations of text using little or indirect supervision and to scale NLP to large problems. His work has been published in various AI, NLP, and machine learning venues and received the Best Paper Award at EMLP 2014. Uh, his work has been supported by grants and awards from NF, NSF, BSF, Google, and Intel. Well, thanks so much, Shava. Uh, learned about uh, being here and giving this talk. Um, I have decided to use a rather grandiose sounding title, uh, mostly because I just wanted to fit in a lot of things and I couldn't find a general enough title to cover everything. But uh, in the spirit of grandioseness, uh, let me start off with uh, this picture that I took at the Smithsonian. Um, if you were around in 1905 um, and you had to fly anywhere, uh, this was the best you could do. This is the right flyer. This was the, flyer, the first plane that was ever built. Um, and it flew a little distance. Um, and we can ask how far have we come in aviation in the hundred or so years? And we've traveled pretty far. Uh, I'm able to fly back to Utah uh, in one day. Uh, I have it on good authority that the first flight roughly covered a distance from this, from here to here. <laughs> so we've come pretty far and this has happened through, uh, you know, rather, um, uh, big improvements in engineering, in particular uh, the use of metal uh, as opposed to canvas and jet engines and such things. I can ask the same question about other areas. If you were around in 1905 and you needed mental health counseling, this was the best you could do. Uh, this is from a different museum. This is from the uh, Sigmund Freud Museum in London. And you know, you, have, you know how this works. The patient goes on this thing here, Freud sits there and they talk. And we can ask the same question. In the same time that we went from that plane made of wood and uh, canvas to a jet engine, how far have we traveled for mental health? It turns out, and uh, this is not just me speaking, this is my collaborators from uh, mental health. It turns out that we've not traveled too far. Uh, we went from that couch in that chair to this couch in this chair. And uh, I gave this talk a few years ago, a few uh, about one last year uh, in a different university, and someone pointed out, yeah, but now women can be therapists too. <laughs> so that's a big leap, and that's pretty much it. It's still two people talking. Oh wait, we also have no. Yes, but uh, roughly, the a, ma a majority of mental health treatment is through talking. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how NLP can be the equivalent of a jet engine in these kinds of fields like mental health, uh, where really there is a dire need for technological uh, improvements. Uh, but then I'll talk about how in order to get there, we need to overcome challenges, uh, a lot of challenges. And uh, I'll mostly talk about the scalability questions, a little bit about representation. I'll completely skip anything about data. Um, let me start off by talking about how NLP can help mental health. Uh, this is uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about from the uh, PhD thesis of Michael uh, Tanana. Zach Imel is my collaborator in, uh, psycho in educational psychology. Of course, NLP is, uh, has got a long history uh, in connection to mental health. If you are like me, an Emacs user, you can play with Eliza uh, by going to Meta X doctor. Um, you know, the general idea of uh, uh, the thing is mental health treatment is a conversation. We can have a chat bot that replaces the therapist. But what does it mean to go to a therapist or actually to any doctor? Usually when you go to a doctor, there is some sort of a diagnosis phase where they find out what's wrong with you. And then there's a treatment phase where they introduce a, you know, make some sort of a change in you. 
And then after the treatment, there's an evaluation. There's some measurement to see whether the treatment worked. In therapy, the diagnosis is two people talking. The treatment is two people talking. And the evaluation is two people talking. So there's a lot of talking. Um, basically, everything here is a dialogue between two people. And some questions are, even despite the fact, despite, you know, uh, the idea of psychoanalysis being about a century old, there is no consensus on whether some treatments work better than the other, whether some therapists are better, uh, whether, you know, there is any objective improvement in mental health quality. And we have no idea why and how therapy works. The way I see it, this is really a collection of NLP problems. Um, we want, the goal here is to make sense of hours and hours of really uh, unstructured and really emotional data dialogue. Um, we can hope to use NLP to you know, answer some of those questions and analyze uh, how therapy works. In particular, we can think of building automated therapists like Eliza. Let's call it a therapy bot. Or we can try to build automated clients or patients. For some reason in this profession, they call them clients rather than patients. But <laughs> we can have automated patients that uh, are used to kind of uh, help therapists train themselves without actually inflicting themselves on a patient. Or you can imagine that there is this omniscient um, helper that observes therapy in progress and kind of guides it, uh, guides the therapist or kind of performs some analysis to uh, uh, provide feedback after the session is over or some such things. Let me give you an example of this sort of an omniscient helper. Oh, by the way, uh, something I say in all talks, I have way too many slides for the hour that I have, and there is no hope that I'll get to the end. I think I have 124 slides. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. There's no reason we need to get to the last slide. So let me give you an example of uh, this omniscient helper um, using this particular therapy session transcript. So the counselor and the patient are talking to each other, and the, this is from the context of uh, uh, a, a patient who wants to quit drinking, who has a problem with alcohol, and the, the counselor asks, how's your progress? Everyone, the patient says, everyone's getting on my case, kind of like a bunch of crows pecking at you. Uh, and the patient says, I'm not sure I can finish my treatment. The counselor just repeats what the patient said, and then the patient kind of reflects on this a bit more. Now, the fundamental question that is really here, uh, that, you know, that's uh, probably the most important thing is, in this process, is a doctor being helpful? Um, the doctor is saying things, but is, the, is he or she saying the right things or useful things? Or unfortunately, what ends up happening is, is he or she saying the wrong things and making the patient worse? Is therapy being useful? It turns out, thankfully, uh, uh, computer scientists are not the first people to ask this question. Uh, this has been a, uh, you know, this forms the basis of uh, um, a set of uh, therapy codes called MISC, where, you know, every utterance of a therapist can be a reflection about something that the client said, or it could be a question, an open question or a closed question. These are essentially like uh, speech acts. Uh, the patient can talk about sustaining their behavior that is, that is unhealthy, or they could talk about changing their behavior, or they could say something, you know, unrelated, like how nice the weather is outside. So under this framework of uh, MISC coding, every utterance can get a code. So when the patient says, I don't think I can finish treatment, it is sustained talk. It is talking about sustaining their bad behavior. Or when the patient says, I want to quit so badly, it is change talk. This is... Uh, the basis of a standard set of uh, codes that exist. And the way these codes are used today is uh, to provide feedback to a therapist. Way a therapist gets feedback is uh, kind of uh, interesting. And this is one of the things that I learned as part of this collaboration. Uh, the patient and the doctor talk to each other. This conversation is recorded and transcribed. And then a grad student labels every utterance manually uh, according to that label. And this is done maybe 12 to 15 times over the course of a year. And then the patient, the therapist gets feedback saying, you remember that session that happened a year ago? 
you remember what you said at minute number 35? That was not right. Um, the problem here, the bottleneck, is the, uh, the labeling. Every utterance needs to be labeled, and you need some sort of feedback. And if the feedback is so delayed, there's no point. And this is where I think uh, we can actually get some automation. The hope is that we can provide feedback to a therapist immediately after a session, or maybe even during a session if we are allowed to use heads up displays. Um, or even better, we can hopefully train better therapists by giving them this process, this uh, feedback when you know we train therapists uh, in college. Um, also, yes. So in your, uh, your instance, you said that um, you know sometime later the therapist is told when you said this particular thing that was wrong, you shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. So where is the information that lets you make that kind of conclusion? So it's, uh, so that was a bit of an exaggeration. You do, they don't specifically say this sentence was wrong. Sure. They say, uh, according to this philosophy of therapy, um, a therapist who makes more reflections tends to have higher correlations with improved outcomes. How do you um, judge improved outcomes? Um, did the patient get better? How do you judge that? Uh, oh, that's a very good question. Through surveys. So self-reporting surveys. So there is some subjectivity there also. But uh, yeah, the, this is something that I try not to probe too hard. Uh, but essentially, the, a patient, they, a patient who has more, who talks about changing more often, uh, changing their behavior more often, might be good. Might, might actually be improving. And uh, a patient who self-reports they are feeling better or stays. In this case, all my data is from uh, is with substance abuse victims. We can actually see if they are back in the ER, for example, and things like that. Um, so. In general, the uh, under this style of therapy, it's called motivational interviewing. More reflections are a good thing um, on the part of the therapist. Confrontations are a bad thing. So, for example, if a therapist says, you must feel like a miserable worm for drinking today, probably that's not a good idea. Uh, and confrontations are something that need to be flagged and kind of should not happen. Um, unfortunately, some statistics says that uh, some surveys uh, show that about one fourth of trained therapists actually make their patients worse, um, which is really bad. Um, which is something that really that's the part that we need. It, it may seem like a bad thing, but also maybe it's a low hanging fruit if we care about improvement. What percentage makes it better? Yeah. Um, <laughs> More hopefully more than 25 percent hopefully more than 25 percent since i have a lot of close collaborators who are therapists i'm not going to answer that question Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the next question. wow that's, that's a bluff <laughs> <laughs> so anyway the hope is that we can actually perform some real analysis rather than just kind of guessing um and the only hope we can uh, the only way we can uh, do that is by kind of actually getting data um the goal, the overarching goal of this whole project is to kind of uh, make this more objective rather than subjectively saying, yeah, that person looks better because he's staying off the streets more. Um, so we collected a data set uh, of 300-ish uh, uh, therapy sessions, a uh, lot of utterances, and uh, this whole data set was for all sorts of reasons focused on uh, uh, therapists, that, you know, Sessions involving patients uh, who are who have substance abuse issues. It could be alcohol or drugs or whatever. And uh, this data set uh, was labeled by grad students with these MI codes. So we essentially have a labeled dialogue data set with, uh, uh, you know, the, it's a sequence of utterances with labels. So we did the most obvious thing. We trained sequence models. Um, frankly, the actual models that we trained are not that uh, fascinating. They are standard things. We did the fir first two things that came to mind. We trained a traditional sequence model and we trained a, a neural network because those two things exist. And uh, the interesting point is that not the underlying uh, aspects of the model, but the fact that these trained models do reasonably well on a lot of the codes that are interesting. So when it comes to, say, uh, identifying that a particular utterance is irrelevant, 
Um, so we are roughly, we, both models are roughly equally good when it comes to uh, the follow neutral, saying that some, something that the client said is irrelevant. Uh, we can do reasonably well with re identifying reflections. We are extremely bad with confrontations. Uh, we cannot identify them at all. Um, and uh, advise and such things. And there are various reasons here. My point here is not to show that, you know, we have solved the problem. What is the x-axis? The x-axis for the circles is uh, like, I think, F1 or accuracy, I think F1. And the little, for the x's, it is uh, the inter-annotator agreement on that label. Um, or some version of that, some measure of performance. So when you're getting your F1 measure, then are you, um, are you doing something to resolve the fact that you've got, you know, sometimes 30% IAA? No, no, we are not. So what are you taking as ground truth? Oh, the ground truth. So this is. Uh, oh, I, I see. So these are not on the same thing. The inter annotator agreement was done on some some subset of the data. They are not the same uh, set of examples. This is just to show you how difficult each of these labels. Right, are. but so the fact that you have a difficult labeling problem still needs to be resolved or not resolved. Right, right. So we did not resolve that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there is we there, we don't have a ground truth for that uh, on that set. Got it. Um, yeah, 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 right. So the point is really not that, you know, we have solved the problem. The point is more that uh, there is this problem and this is literally the first thing that we tried. And it's interesting that even the first thing we tried when we presented it to a therapist and showed them feedback saying, look, here are the things they found it to be useful. In fact, Mike built a nice demo for this system. Please don't hit the server right now. It may or may not be down. Uh, but uh, he also built some visualization of aggregate uh, results from therapies uh, sessions, and it turns out they found it useful. Even the models that I personally think are kind of okay, not great. So, for example, uh, the, I remember a, a talk that Ray Mooney once gave where he said, you know, you should not just have cherry picked your results, but you should also have, you should also pick lemons. So, I'm going to cherry pick and lemon pick. I'm going to show you good and bad comments. Um, so, the the, when the, the doctor says, uh, you just graduated and you accomplished some of your goals, it sounds like, hey, this is a simple reflection. This is a, essentially a restatement of the fact of what the client just said. And uh, both models kind of get it. Um, at the bottom, it seems like you were drinking seven nights a week, about uh, four drinks at a time. The doctor is actually giving information, but the models kind of confuse it with reflection. Um, once again, this is not the end of it, I'm just pointing out that this domain has a, presents a fantastic opportunity for uh, making a, a real change because it is completely unexplored. And I think more of us can be working on this. The data public? The data is public-ish. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, in fact, we were just talking about this over lunch. Uh, there is uh, the, these session, these therapy sessions from the are um available through this organization called alexander street press just like ldc you need to buy a subscription and you get the therapy sessions and uh, if you get those sessions we can give you the labels on top of it um, we have data for the mi codes and also sentiment for uh, i think utterance level stuff in fact we had a we, we realized that uh, training using sentiment models from uh, that on movie corpora for therapy sessions is not a good idea. Who would have thought? Anyway, so the point is uh, be, beyond you know the standard sort of uh, 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 information extraction like domains uh, in say large news corpora. I think uh, these are the domains where NLP can be can make a big impact. But of course, we haven't solved any problem yet we are just uh, identifying the problems and i'm particularly interested in uh, three classes of uh, problems one of them involves uh, representations uh, it's not clear what is a good representation of language if i care about reasoning about it uh, and even if we have a good representation like for example the mi codes or uh, amr or uh, anything else or maybe vectors to capture everything uh, even if we have all these representations, it's not always clear how we get annotated data because it's very expensive and maybe we can have algorithmic solutions for that. Um, 
And another problem that I think is uh, pressing and not that um, uh, addressed is the question of efficiency. Um, if we want to build these models to, uh, you know, scale these models to work in every hospital and every doctor and every patient, um, I don't think we have enough energy on the planet to power these devices. So we need to think about efficiency as a first class citizen rather than just, you know, like making it somebody else's problem. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to talk about the data thing part at all. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some work that I've been doing with uh, representations and a lot more time talking about the efficiency part of it. So this could be a good checkpoint for any questions because I will not go back to the mental health part after this. How many doctors are there in the world? Way more than I know. Well, there are a lot more patients in the world. Yeah, sure. Right. Everybody's a patient. Well. Yes, everyone is a potential patient. Um, it, it gets more complicated when you want to uh, uh, do things like precision medicine, for example, where you want to personalize the healthcare to a particular patient, their DNA, their history, and you want to discover a new drug that may have been published in a research paper in the last two years, and you need to read every paper. So that makes it the problem. That, that makes it problematic. Uh, my uh, favorite uh, use case of that question is uh, my former colleague, colleague had a kid, has a kid, who was the first, who, who had a condition uh, from birth, and he was the first ever individual on the planet to be diagnosed with that condition. Um, and so, there, are, there is no published work on this. And so they had to basically do literature search in a way that we never do. And it turns out that uh, through this process, they discovered 50 other people with the same condition. And there is an effort. Anyway, so these rare diseases require more um, effort. Okay, so let me talk about uh, this uh, representation challenge. How we we care, the we want to represent meaning in, and reason, in a way that allows us to reason about text. And I'm going to give you my sort of biased view of how we can build these representations. And as an example, I'm going to use reading comprehension. Um, despite what we may believe uh, with the squad kind of results, reading comprehension is not solved. Um, and it can be particularly hard, especially when we, it involves uh, domains that may be that may involve you know complicated words. So there's been this paragraph has been up for a while. So can one shout out the answer? B. It probably is a B. Uh, I also think it's B. Uh, not just because it says so on my slide, uh, but because um, if you look at these things. By the way, half these words, uh, at least one of these words, I have no idea what it means. Um, but we can think of there being some sort of events in this text, the splitting and absorption and transfer, and somehow there's some intuition, there's some something in the text tells us that the splitting enables the transfer. So we, the transfer requires splitting as a precondition. Absorption directly causes the transfer, and this basically a directed graph over events. And if we had this directed graph, we can just see that uh, there's a path from splitting to transfer. There's no part. Uh, path from uh, uh, splitting to absorption. So this could be a representation that could help. Um, more, we formalize this in the work in the form of a graph. The events are essentially like predicate argument structures, and then there's uh, uh, causal graphs over the events. And the question really that we tried to ask was, does, can, does this representation help reading comprehension? And I'm going to skip over a lot of the technical details of how this representation was built in the interest of time. The, the, the punchline was that, you know, on this particular data set where the text was from a biology textbook and the questions were AP like, uh, AP exam like questions, shallow approaches didn't work because we tailored the questions to be actually uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, a human, a biologist, was able to get 99% almost on this. Um, using the right representation helps quite a bit. Uh, this last column is uh, um, a fully uh, automatic system that takes raw text and produces the answer. And it does much better than something that does not use this representation. Once again, this is just 
uh, a data point that shows that uh, thinking about some sort of a uh, event representation is not a bad idea. Um, in my mind, the key lesson here is that uh, building a representation that's developed around linguistic intuitions is probably a good thing, but it can be rather difficult because it involves, uh, in that particular project, we had to train three biologists uh, about basic linguistics and nobody was happy. Uh, so just going, uh, you know, continuing this uh, line of thinking, uh, this is the entire acquisition gang. You came, brought it up. Um, a particular obsession of mine over the, about nine years now has been about uh, thinking about preposition semantics and how um, how to how to best represent the meaning of a preposition. So if you cannot read the little text there, it says uh, the this is Wilbur the pig holding a sign that says "Will work as good." And uh, the little text says, due to his grammar mistake, Wilbur found a position. It just wasn't the position he wanted. Um, so prepositions are important and they carry a lot of uh, meaning. And uh, long story short, uh, we had this uh, work recently where we built an inventory of relations that uh, we call super senses that prepositions express. And uh, these are roughly in three buckets where you can have uh, core arguments like agents and themes and such things. These are semantic roles. You can have circumstances like time and location and means and mediums and such things. Or you, because prepositions can also connect nouns, you can have uh, uh, path hole relations and you can have accompaniers and social relations uh, expressed by prepositions. Um, we built a data set where we annotated uh, the review scores section of the web tree bank with these things. And we also got uh, some inter annotator agreement on little prints because that was cool. Um, here at the bottom is an example of the kind of uh, labels that we have. The width at the top is a theme. The width at the bottom is a characteristic. And uh, this data set is available. You can play with it. Um, and we trained again, once again, we trained two models. Uh, they're just annotating prepositions or? Only prepositions and possessives also. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, prepositions and possessives. And the idea is that we are trying to identify what is the relation between the governor and the complement. Um, that's the roughly semantic uh, uh, governor, not syntactic, but they tend to overlap most of the time. So you wouldn't do implied prepositions so like you might have you know, a hotel on the beach or you might have a beach hotel yeah so there's not it's not non compound it's explicit uh, okay. pre preposition mentioned mm -hmm. yes the idea is that a preposition can evoke a relation and we are trying to see what the relation is and there is actually a, this is a much simplified version there is another layer of uh, complexity here which i just don't want to talk about because that becomes its own talk the other layer of complexity just to give a hint is uh, sometimes prepositions have a functional relation that they express and they also have a semantic meaning and they don't tend to be the same sometimes and this uh, uh, framework allows that. Um, so uh, again, you know, because we live in the land of neural networks, we train two, mo two models, uh, one with a neural network, one with uh, features that uh, actually were invented by Ed Hovey long back. Um, for another preposition task. And we get, you know, about 70% uh, um, accuracies. Uh, but if we have gold standard uh, identification, gold identification of uh, prepositions and possessives, and we have gold syntax, with predicted syntax, it goes down to about 55%. Um, they look promising, but frankly, they are lousy uh, because 55% means that they are really bad. There's still a long way to go, and uh, I st I'm convinced after multiple iterations that this uh, inventory of relations, this is my third or fourth iteration of this, uh, is the right one. But you know that's what I thought the last time also. Um, this seems more right than the previous one, and it seems more right for the following reason: uh, it's it is starting to look a lot like some uh, like VerbNet. Uh, it, is, it also has, uh, now we are trying to move to new languages, uh, Hebrew, German, and Korean, and there seems to be some uh, 
it seems to be more stable and we are able to actually label things using this inventory without breaking uh, everything. So I'm not going to talk more about representations because uh, this was not my intended uh, amount of time I wanted to spend on it. Uh, the question that uh, I had in mind was what is a good representation of language? And my bias is uh, I feel like you should not throw away linguistic intuitions just because deep neural networks uh, seem to work very well. Um, uh, I think we need structured representations and really the modeling challenge is how do we build neural models that can reason about structured representation. Um, I said I'm going to skip the question about data. Um, basically, I've got some a line of work where we can actually use uh, incidental supervision, incidental signals that are available for free, like temporal correlation between things to train these kind of structured models without having to annotate uh, everything. Um, you can ask me afterwards if you have any questions about that. Let me now go to the efficiency question. Uh, the, uh, the problem is that we want to scale NLP to every device, every book, every document, every library out there, and how do we do that? And my argument is that we need a ground up rethinking of how um, we apply statistical methods for NLP. Uh, we can start, we, we need, you know, because everything seems to be centered around dot products, we probably need faster dot products. Uh, we need to rethink how feature extraction works. It seems to be like the first thing we do and it's always somebody else's problem. And we can rethink how inference works because we need to predict these kinds of structures and maybe there's some uh, rethinking there also. And I'm going to talk about the first two bits. And in order to kind of motivate this, uh, let me, let's do a little thought experiment. Um, let's say you have some text and you need to analyze it like this sentence here. Let's say you have to write the parse tree for that sentence. Um, and uh, let's say you have uh, some in your mind, you do some work, you expand the effort that's needed and you get the tree. And tomorrow I give you a new sentence that is similar to the first one. I changed one word. Why would you have to expend the same amount of computational effort for the new word when you have essentially parsed most of the new sentence, most of the parse tree should be the same. Maybe only minor changes need to be done. And so maybe we can be, if you had cached some of the previous computation, you can save on time. So this is the general idea that I've been uh, thinking about for a few years now. And this is not a new idea at all. Uh, reducing redundant computation is, uh, goes back to this paper from 1968 uh, that this paper introduced the idea of memoization, Don Mickey. And this is the paper that interestingly uh, also introduced it in the context of machine learning. And so it's a very, very cool paper. If you've not read it, I strongly recommend it. And uh, the first line of the abstract says it would be useful if computers can learn from experience and thus automatically improve the efficiency of their own programs during execution. That's the goal. And the idea was to memoize. The idea is if you recognize a situation that you've already seen before, you don't redo the work, you just reuse the previous computation. And the only problem here is how do you know this situation looks like something else you've seen before? And that uh, in this paper, uh, Mickey proposes that that should be a learnable question. That should be learned. And that's what we tried um, in this work where we try to speed up structured output prediction by no, trying to recognize that something has already been seen before and we not have to re redo everything. So let me use an example of uh, entity relation extraction to motivate this problem. Um, so, so the input to this kind of a problem is uh, some text. Uh, Colin went back to home to Arden Village. And the goal is to fill up this kind of a frame that says Colin is a person, this is a location, uh, and Colin lives in this location. The output is a structure. It could be this kind of a frame, or it could be a tree, or something like that. And I'm, I'm not showing interdependencies between the output, outputs here, uh, or, or the output elements here. Uh, structured prediction essentially requires exploring this combinatorial space of all possible outcomes uh, and picking the best one. Uh, 
Um, and the problem here is that the space of all possible outcomes can be uh, extremely large. Uh, and we may have to design specialized algorithms for certain classes of uh, models, like say, if you want to parse, we have the we have all these uh, dynamic programming algorithms. But can we make prediction faster by recognizing regularities at the level of the entire problem rather than just doing dynamic programming for that particular instance? Um, to answer that question, here's the setup. Suppose we have a classifier that we've already trained and it scores partial structures and we have a black box. I don't care how it's implemented. We have a black box that looks at the, a new input and uh, performs inference to identify the best structure. It could be this black box could be some search. It could be an integer program. It could be a uh, dynamic programming, whatever. In any case, at, after everything is trained, we are given a new input and we need to find a new graph, tree, structure, whatever you want, uh, and uh, in order to uh, find the output. And to do that, we need to explore the entire search space. Uh, and that's why inference can be thought of as search. And this is a search tree that we are building. We start off with the empty structure um, and you know we can find all the way down, uh, path down to the thing. And one perspective on inference is we want to find a a valid leaf in the search tree that has the best cost. Uh, best could be highest or lowest, depending on your whether you're an optimist or not. Um, and uh, by valid, I mean we need a leaf where we don't get absurd things like locations work for location. We want a leaf where some sort of consistency constraints are met. This search tree is, of course, uh, can be exponentially large and uh, as we, to navigate this tree, we usually use something like greedy search or beam search or something. But it, it this is not the only way to do inference. You can navigate the tree in one shot using, uh, say, a, an integer program. You can be more clever and build a dynamic programming approach to kind of uh, build the output constructively. There are other ways, but the inference as search is a very useful way to think about it. The problem is, if you have to exhaustively enumerate all possible outcomes and find the best pro outcome, uh, that is exact. You are going to get the argmax or the argmin, but this can be very slow. Uh, approximate or heuristic search, greedy or beam, is fast, but it can be inexact. What I would like is the best of uh, both these worlds. By essentially imagining that we have this exhaustive search procedure that we want to make faster. The rough sketch of the idea is in the inexact search, in, in greedy search, the problem is that if we were allowed to ignore all these consistency uh, requirements, we just follow the next best output, the next best uh, path in the search tree and keep going down, that's trivial. We just keep building it and the size of the, the complexity is however deep the tree is, that's how, far, uh, how much time it takes. It can lead to bad structures if you ignore these constraints, but let's say we ignore them, meaning we can allow things like locations working for people. But we augment the, pa the path cost with a learned uh, term that encourages validity and it favors paths that were successful in previous, successful for previous input. The idea being that if a certain part of a certain situation was previously encountered and the black box solver that is expensive took a certain action, let's just take it and see what happens rather than having to recompute everything from scratch. So originally in this kind of a tree, if the path cost for a particular node was just a model score, we're going to augment it with what we're calling a speed up heuristic. Uh, that captures sort of structural constraints and dependencies. And this heuristic is learned over the lifetime or this uh, the, the parameters for this heuristic is learned over the lifetime of uh, this model, let's say a parser. So the, the hope is as you have a parser that exists longer, it gets faster because certain, uh, the certain paths become more and more strong according to the speed of, speed of heuristic. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about training because uh, at the heart of it, the learning algorithm here is uh, 
could be any learning to search kind of framework. Uh, what we had was very similar to like Lasso or uh, actually a variant of that. Um, the, the setup is we have a black box classifier that we've already trained and we want to make it faster. And we have a collection of examples that are not labeled that are mimicking the lifetime of this model. And you're going to use this collection to train the speed up heuristic. And let's for now assume that we've already trained the speed, we already have a bunch of speed up features. We're going to use this sort of a imitation learning kind of a framework to train this uh, speed up classifier to mimic the heuristic. But because the, the speed up classifier is just a search based system, it's going to do well. It's going to uh, get faster. Um, as a concrete example, we use this task of predicting entities and relations where the black box was an integer program solver. Uh, the way we set up the model, we can prove on paper, I think, that the, uh, the, the inference problem is NP-hard, but the ILP solver does uh, shockingly well. And we train the speed up model on a subsection of the gigawatt corpus. And keep in mind that we care about both the output quality, we want high quality outputs, and we want uh, the inference time to be slow. So we compared uh, three groups of uh, models. We had the black box solver, that's the ILP. We used pure search without any speed up or any constraint, and we had the speed up model. On that side, on the farther side, you have uh, the output quality where higher numbers are better. On this side, we have time where lower is better. Of course, first of all, the search baseline is faster than the integer program because it just explores its greedy search. It does not explore the entire space. But it's not good in terms of accuracy, in particular for relations, it does much worse. The speed up model is uh, much faster than the original ILP, and it also performs roughly just as well as the ILP model. So we have, in some sense, the best of uh, both these worlds. We have fast models, that are really good, and we have trained this model to become faster. Um, intuitively, what the speed up model actually gives us is it prioritizes uh, regions of the search space that look like they have been successful in the past. Um, uh, it, and because greedy search is fast, we also get speed. But actually, there's more. It gives us a little bit more because we can start. So if you think about how I uh, set up the path cost, the path cost was the, 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 the cost of taking any edge was the cost that the original model gives minus the speed of heuristics score. And the, the cost of the, 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 a single model, you know, computing the model score can be expensive because we have to extract features and all these things and feature extraction can be slow. But if the speed of heuristic strongly, strongly prefers a certain node, Maybe it does not matter what the model score says, it, can, it gets overridden. Let's say the speed of, speed of heuristic in this case is a huge positive number. Let's say it's positive infinity. There is nothing that the model score can do to change it. Maybe in those cases, there's no point in overriding, uh, in computing the input features at all. So we can actually save X more time by not even computing the features. We instantiated the, uh, somewhat simplistic version of this idea using a single parameter that we call theta. Uh, theta is small would mean that the model is ignored more aggressively. And this is something that we can set. Um, theta is zero achieves the fastest inference. Basically, it just ignores the model and you know, goes through finding the best thing according to the speed up classifier. And it's super fast, but it's really bad in terms of any output quality. And we found that you know some value of theta in between is uh, gives us a much faster speed, and actually gives also helps uh, recover the accuracy. So we can get really fast uh, uh, predictions without actually sacrificing accuracy. So I have ten minutes left. Is that right? Yeah. Roughly. So in those ten minutes, I'm going to talk about this problem of feature extraction. Uh, feature extraction is always somebody else's problem. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, it's, we assume that feature extraction is done and uh, we, uh, we build models on top of it. But if we are going to talk about model statistical models that are going to exist forever and keep pre making predictions, or for example, say we want to parse the internet, feature extraction is going to add up and it's going to take a lot of time. So can we make this faster? 
this is some a question that got into my head because of a reviewer comment for an earlier paper where I had this cool math, all this math that said, oh, we can make inference faster. And the reviewer said, yeah, but I know speed feature extraction is going to be slower than everything you do. So what can you do? So let's look at feature extraction. Let's say we have this sentence. We can, in typical NLP feature might be some, something called the word, which is the surface form of this word, which produces an indicator for the event that the word is hacked. But really, this indicator is just a shorthand for a large sparse vector that is zero everywhere, except this one position where the word is hacked. Concretely, feature extractors should be seen as functions. You can have word, part of speech, dependency path, and such things. They could be indicators. They could be producing uh, vectors using a deep neural network. Essentially, a feature extractor is any function that maps objects in the real world, like words or images or anything, to some vector space, possibly infinite dimensional. Now, once you start thinking of feature extractors as functions, as first class citizens that you can reason about, you can define a couple of operators on top of these functions. Feature addition is an operator that takes two feature extractors, word and dependency path, and produces the sum. So I'm going to call this word plus dev path. That is a function that maps any inputs to this other vector. It, so essentially, feature addition is a function that is an operation that takes two feature extractors and produces a new feature extractor. Feature conjunction is another such operator that takes two feature extractors and produces um, uh, an, a, another feature extractor, which is uh, you know it's equivalent to the Boolean conjunction. Um, it's also another operator that takes two functions and produces a function. This seems like just pedantry, but uh, the nice thing about these two operators is that the, it gives us this theorem: the set of all possible feature extractors with these two operators, addition and conjunction, forms a commutative semi-ring. And the proof is actually rather trivial, uh, except it's rather boring. Um, it, you can just enumerate all the properties and you get a commutative semi-ring. And the obvious question is, so what? Uh, this is cute, but what does this give us? Give us? Turns out it gives us an opportunity for speed up. Commutative semi-rings come with a distributive property and that allows us to refactor things. So consider this case where you have three feature extractors, A, B, and C, and my feature set is A and B con uh, and plus A and C. There are two conjunctions in one addition, but because I can apply the distributive property, I can say this is the same as A and B plus C, so I reduce the number of conjunctions. It may look rather trivial, but it saves us computation in two ways. First, there's fewer computational steps to do, more importantly, this is done at uh, the symbolic level before any features are ever computed. And so we can do this once and kind of get the savings forever. Um, of course, this can help only if we can do this automatically. And that brings me the, to the coolest paper I've read ever uh, called the Generalized Distributive Law, which tells us that any commutative semi-ring admit the use of what is called the Generalized Distributive Law algorithm to calculate sums of products path. And the generalized distributive law algorithm is an algorithm that we are all intimately familiar with. If you have used belief propagation, bomb welch Viterbi, or um, some, some variant of uh, Fourier transforms or anything, all of them come with semi, uh, come, are essentially the same algorithm applied to a different semi ring. And uh, now I have a commutative semi ring. We can instantiate this algorithm. Of course, there are a lot of technical details that I'm kind of skipping here. But what we get at the end is, if you give me a feature set that uh, uses additions and conjunctions, we can symbolically refactor it uh, by kind of reorganizing the uh, feature extractor to you know, remove redundant computations, uh, so to reduce redundant computation. And the refactored feature extractor is identi identical to the one that we saw before. Uh, this really works. So I tried this with uh, two different tasks, standard features that were uh, from not mine, someone else's. And we can actually reduce the wall clock time by just literally taking a feature set and refactoring it and running it. Um, it works even better on these uh, text chunking features from Andre, Andre Martins. We get like a big drop in time um, because essentially the number of con conjunctions 
is reduced. So we are essentially gaining time by not doing work. So, and the theorem guarantees that these are identical. So what we had is because of this algebraic formalization of feature extraction, we can uh, de design a message passing algorithm that makes feature extraction faster by automatically refactoring them. Once again, the intuition is goes back to this uh, old paper uh, where we recognize redundant redundancies in computation over not individual instances, but entire tasks or entire problems at essentially um, first order level. And by doing this refactoring at a first order level, we can actually get some big gains. So the, my, my efficiency story is that uh, is the story of laziness. Don't do any extra work and remember everything that you did. I'm amazingly a minute ahead of time. So I'll probably just stop. Uh, I started this talk with this uh, idea that you know NLP has the potential to be applied in a lot of broad uh, collection of domains. And I use this uh, empathy or uh, this idea of mental health as an illustrative example where um, other people outside of CS might find NLP useful. Um, I spoke about uh, a little bit about representations and some work on involving structured representations that use uh, linguistic intuition to be built to build them. And I spent a lot of time talking about scalability, which is essentially where the uh, the entire story is that don't do any work unless you have to, and that's really my philosophy in life. All right, I'll stop now and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Um, I'm trying to understand at a kind of more intuitive level how the, your, um, this is like a dynamic programming algorithm. So it is exactly a dynamic program. Um, and so like, just as an intuitive case, just in terms of a thing that would speed up work, Tell me if I'm, I'm getting this right. So you could find, um, you could have a feature that is the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the grandparent of the word, mm -hmm. uh, an independency parse. And you could also have a feature that's the prefix of the grandparent. Right. And it would be faster if you only retrieved that's the grandparent. Exactly it. For once. That's exactly it. Okay. Um, but so I know that I would do it in that order because I know that it's, and so in other words, you could imagine a naive approach would be parse, you know, parse the sentence and take the grandparent. And then another one would be parse the sentence and take, take the, the grandparent's grandparent prefix. And, and of course, what you want to do is parse the sentence and then from the grandparent, take the identity and it's prefix. That's exactly. Um, I could imagine a case where, um, I'm trying to think of something where there's like two kind of, so um, the, well, okay. The prefix operator, right, right, um, is presumably faster, although maybe not always. It's because you're doing so. You're, um, I said that I take the prefix, right? So you're doing a morphological analysis and you're doing a dependency parse, right, right. and these are black box programs. Right. So it, the order of operations is not necessarily clear to me, and you might need to do. Uh, it, I'm not sure how you would do the right search to figure out which of these things so, is the time saver. In this particular case, uh, the so in all the experiments I uh, had, I did not um, prioritize anything according to how much time it takes. But it turns out like somewhere hidden inside the details. So the 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 way the dynamic program sort of works is um, it tries to set up a junction tree and finds a path, uh, you know, a message for, to the root. And the way you construct the junction tree uh, could be guided by whether you one thing is faster than the other. So you want slow things at the top of the tree so that they get refactored to the outside. Now, in the limit, it, or in the worst case, it turns out finding the optimum refactoring is NP-hard. The, so there is really no, uh, optimum, uh, there, there's, we can't do it in an optimal way, but uh, there are some rough heuristics that you could use. For example, you could take each of these feature extraction, the, the, the prefix and the, the morphological analyzer and the dependency parser, 
run them on a bunch of things and you get time, you can measure time, and the time actually becomes a parameter in the construction of the tree. It may not be perfect, but it turns out it's surprisingly good. Okay, but you didn't do that, right? You I did not do that. I so, do you know where you got your speed up? Like, Yeah, I, I, by not actually doing, by looking up the hash tables, by not uh, going to the tree and just finding the parent. Uh, in, the, in the text chunking case, all the features were um, n grams, unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, up to five grams of words and in the context and of parts of speech. Now, I had already gotten the part of speech computed, so it was not like I was running the tagger again, mm -hmm. but just the lookup and the dictionary lookups were taking time because these dictionaries were huge. And by not doing that, we get a, a speed up. It, it was, honestly speaking, the numbers were so good that I had to check that they were not a bug. Uh, but it turns out even looking up a dictionary, even though it's a constant time operation, if your dictionary is so big that you have to, as the size of the vocabulary, it takes time. That was literally the only reason why the wall clock improved. But, but th there is potential for more gains if you had more complex operations. But in the, in the hint of full disclosure though, I think there's also a potential for more gains without doing all this by um, keeping track of if you have already computed this feature before, just one bit of memory and just looking it up. But uh, that requires some forethought in terms of the black box uh, feature extractors. There essentially there's some memoization that's needed one way or another. Any other questions? So we thank our speaker again. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think we're moving on.